How y'all doing today? Good, good. I was getting a little worried about that, that storm earlier today, but uh, someone said today, if you don't like the weather in Arkansas, wait a minute. Uh, so I'm uh, happy you all waited a minute and then came down here. It's great to, to be here tonight. Um, thank you, Dean Rutherford, very much for welcoming me and for that nice introduction and uh, to Nikolai for picking me up at the airport today. I had a 7 a.m. flight out here connecting in St. Louis and I've been on the road. This is my seventh city and seventh lecture in 14 days in two countries. So I'm, uh, I, I am tired, but I'm still here and ready to go. So tonight, uh, I wanted to just thank everybody here at the Clinton School and then also at the Harvard Club of Little Rock for having me. Um, the Harvard Alumni Association has a faculty speakers bureau where those of us on the faculty who, who agree to do so uh, travel all over the world uh, to meet with alums uh, from various schools and various generations to, to give a little taste of the university and the work that we do there uh, out in the world. And so I, five of those seven lectures have been to Harvard clubs in different places. And so I'm really thrilled to, to, to be here and also to be here at the Clinton School which is a school that is in many ways a kindred spirit to the Kennedy School. Uh, I had the great, great uh, honor of being the person uh, who interviewed Secretary of State, former Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton when she came to Boston on her book tour in the fall, uh, right after the week after Thanksgiving. And my niece Malia, who is in, uh, next week turns nine, actually this Saturday is her ninth birthday party at Harvard. Uh, she's named for Malia Obama. She got to ask the Secretary her, the last question of the night at Boston Opera House and it was a, a special night for our family and, and the picture we took uh, reminded those of us in our family of that picture when Bill Clinton uh, and Boys Nation met John F. Kennedy and my niece the look in her face and the kind of aspiration in her eyes when she met uh, former Secretary Clinton uh, was really special so it's really wonderful to be here in Little Rock uh, as well. Tonight I want to talk about pedagogy and privilege, uh, teaching the values of public service and social justice. Uh, I want to say from the outset that uh, in some ways this talk and my professional and political life has been inspired by many teachers along the way, but in particular one who I'd like to note and name tonight, and that's uh, Dr. Robert Coles. Uh, Robert Coles was my professor and mentor uh, when I was a student at Harvard as an undergraduate. He will receive next week uh, Har the Harvard Medal, which is Harvard's top award at graduation. And I have the enormous honor next week, it's my 25th reunion, so I think they're giving me all these prizes and then they're going to put me in a warehouse somewhere uh, after next week. But I get to both uh, be the faculty escort for John Lewis, who's our commencement speaker, and I get to uh, sit next to Dr. Robert Coles, my mentor on stage when he receives the Harvard Medal at my 25th reunion. So I'm just going to sort of take that all in and then I'm going to go into the warehouse and no one will ever hear from me again. Um, Robert Coles was the person who first told me when I took his course, The Literature of Social Reflection, in the fall of 1991, that I had to go south that I'd been studying history and literature and African American studies, and I had developed a particular interest in the civil rights struggle and the long black freedom struggle, and of the role that white and black people played, uh, often in tough and difficult solidarity with one another at really important inflection points in American history to change this nation and to realize the founding ideals which were always both aspirational and still in our day in many ways elusive. And Robert Coles told me, and I was a Yankee, I was from New York, loved the Yankees, uh, still do, uh, very much a New Yorker, had only been to Disney World, that's as south as it got for me, uh, and then in college he said, if you really want to study this and you want to be part of this and you want to understand this country, you have to go south. And I did, and it changed my life just like he changed my life. So I want to say that from the get-go because uh, in many ways I'm here in uh, Dr. Coles' spirit um, and certainly here because of his influence. So I want to do three things tonight. First thing I want to do is to talk just uh, briefly about some of the pedagogical opportunities and also challenges that I think uh, are involved in the teaching of the values of public service and social justice, especially at a place of great privilege like Harvard. 
Uh, so that's the first thing I want to do is some pedagogical opportunities and challenges. The second thing I want to do is to, to give you a little bit of a sketch of some of the pedagogical commitments that I have been engaged in over the course of my teaching career, which now dates 22 years. And I want to just give you a little bit of a, a taste or a glimpse of those pedagogical commitments to, to, to raise them up as locations um, for teaching the values of public service and social justice. And then the third thing I want to do is just offer briefly some lessons that I've learned over the years um, about the importance, what I call the pedagogical imperative of teaching public service and social justice, uh, especially in these very difficult and also exciting and I think transformational times. And then I'll leave some time, of course, at the end for Q&A. So first are the sort of opportunities and challenges of doing this work. At a place like Harvard, um, luckily, uh, nearly three quarters of undergraduates during their time there, full 75 to 80 percent of undergraduates at Harvard do some form of public service or social justice work, uh, either during the term time or during the summertime. There is a, a growing uh, uh, summer urban program uh, opportunity for students. There'll be hundreds of students over the summer who work in camps for children uh, throughout the Cambridge and Boston areas. And these are, are robust opportunities for students to be engaged in this work. And I myself got my start. I was just telling uh, uh, my colleague that I first, the first thing I did when I got to Harvard was attend a South African divestment rally, which my parents took to be a sign of things to come. Uh, I had not yet even registered or thought about classes yet, and so I did that, activism on the one hand, and then I signed up to teach Head Start in the Cambridge Public Schools. Those were the first two things I did when I got to college, which were very much a, a sign of things to come. Again, I had not thought about classes. My parents said, you know, honey, maybe you should think about what classes you're gonna take since we're paying all that money. Um, Speaking of money, one of the things that has opened up the possibility for students to do this kind of work in the term and summertime is Harvard's financial aid initiative. And I always want to mark this, especially when there are alums in the room, because the fact of the matter is that the, the, the money that you give to Harvard, the unrestricted money or the marked money for financial aid, is in one of the things that opens up the possibility for my students who come from low income and moderate income families, of which I was one, uh, to do service so they don't have to have a job. But their job is actually to do service and to run these programs in the community, and that's been a really remarkable thing. So there are all sorts of service opportunities, term time, summer time, and then also there are increasingly now, and I think it's a mark of the times, and I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A, uh, students who are vocally and visibly and vigilantly involved in social justice activism around a whole host of issues, workers' rights and immigrant rights, LGBTQ equality, environmental justice, anti-poverty and prison reform work, gun reform and gun violence issues, educational equity, global health and human rights, anti-trafficking work, and the like. This, these commitments that these students are increasingly committed to really stand in a long tradition that I myself was part of, of anti-apartheid work, of living wage work, of anti-war protests, Occupy Harvard, the Black Lives Matter movement, and the DACA movements and Dreamer movements more recently. And so these current students who are very much energized in a way I haven't seen in, in nearly a generation are really part of a longer history of social justice activism on, uh, on campus. As I said, that service and justice work is often housed within what is called the Phillips Brooks House Association. Those of you who are alums from Harvard will, will know that organization. And that is the largest and oldest student-run social justice and public service organization in the nation. And this is, it's a physical place, the Phillips Brooks House, uh, but it's also an association, a nonprofit that does all sorts of work and is responsible for tending to the needs of literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people in the Boston and Cambridge metro area. And this is an astonishing organization that I was part of as an undergraduate, that Robert Coles was part of when he was an undergraduate, that goes on and on across four or five centuries, or four or five generations of over a century of that kind of work. This is a moment, I think, 
at Harvard where you are seeing more and more students commit themselves to the work of public service and the work of social justice. And also a moment where those students are not seeing those two things as discrete enterprises. That you do public service or charity work on the one hand if you're one kind of person and you do social justice activism and advocacy and protest on the other if you're another kind of person usually oriented around some kind of political or ideological spectrum from the center liberal point there to the to the sort of left radical progressive point that our students are actually blurring those boundaries in a way that I haven't seen again in over a generation and connecting those dots that they don't see service work and justice work as being incompatible with one another. Another piece of the opportunities that I want to talk about is just briefly is that the graduate schools where I am also housed. So I have an interesting appointment where I'm principally appointed at the graduate schools of public policy, the Kennedy School and the Graduate School of education, um, but I also teach courses in the undergraduate curriculum in the undergraduate college and uh, in history and literature, African American studies, and then women, gender, and sexuality studies. And so I have an interesting vantage point for all of this because I teach folks who are literally 18, 19 years old all the way to people who are 60. Our mid-career program at the Kennedy School has the oldest member of which this year is 62. That's not mid-career for me. I will be retired on a beach sipping a rum cocktail long before I turn 62, I hope. Um, but these, I have this, I way of looking at the ways that these students from literally two or three generations are sort of working in this location in this landscape right now. And one of the things I think the graduate schools do better than the college, even though the college has, in many ways, many more opportunities for public service and social justice work built into the architecture of the experience. The schools, the graduate schools, particularly the Ed School and the Kennedy School, have a lot of curricular-based, kind of integrated service and justice work that is really experiential, where students are practicing and experiencing the kind of learning uh, that they are trying to direct derive from their experiences there. So there are all sorts of opportunities within courses uh, in summer internships that we fund through what we call the policy analysis exercise, which is basically the capstone master's project at the Kennedy School, where students in pairs usually are paired with organizations that need particular problems solved or questions answered or research or analytics done. And they're trying to work with municipal governments or nonprofits or human rights NGOs or uh, different kinds of movement organizations to try to use their what they're learning in the Kennedy School to apply to these larger kinds of social problems around issue, everything from how to deliver um, you know, social services to people in cities more efficiently and more effectively to how to scale up and scale out online training for resistance movement organizations to how do we combat, be, imp, implement best practices to deal with the increasing prevalence of sex trafficking in Southeast Asia. So they're addressing all sorts of problems through these, these, these experiences and through the curriculum. And as I said, the graduate schools, I think, are much better at this kind of integrated model of using curriculum and classes to do this service and justice work uh, more broadly. But all this is to say that there are some deep... There's a deep ethic, I think, in an increasing and accelerating and amplified kind of commitment, particularly right now, in this historical and political moment, to service and justice and the yoking together of the two as a, as a calling, as a way of life, as a professional kind of way in the world. Now that said, there are all sorts of challenges, and I want to mention just a few of them quickly. First is compartmentalization, that at Harvard, in the college, certainly, and also at the graduate schools, and I think this is true of a lot of places, we were talking about this earlier in the library, um, the compartmentalization of both curricular and extracurricular or co-curricular kinds of things. So if you're doing service and justice, that's what you do in your spare time, in your extra time, in your outside of class time. And what happens in the classroom is its own thing, and it's hermetically sealed, and it doesn't have much to do with all of that. And so these two things may be seen as having some relationship with each other, but more often in the not at universities and colleges that I have taught at and that I go and speak at and hear from, uh, there's a compartmentalization between the curricular and the co-curricular. There's also too often, as I mentioned before, a separation between uh, service and justice. The idea that service is one thing and justice is another and that those two things are not related. And I know in my own experience that the kind of service work that I initially did in homeless shelters and prisons and in public schools 
schools and in other places uh, in the world, were the places where I developed an analysis of structural oppression and of inequality and of the impacts of racism and misogyny and homophobia and poverty and these kinds of things. And then it's through that service work often that we are first introduced where the consciousness opens up to these larger structural and systemic forms of inequality and prejudice and oppression. And so I think too often we compartmentalize service and justice just like we compartmentalize curricular and co-curricular kinds of activities. And then this manifests itself in this pervasive kind of discourse about what happens in the classroom, the real learning, and what happens in the so-called real world, which is this like imagined space of sort of post-college life and it's somehow outside the realm of what we do. When in fact we know that every single one of us when we enter a classroom brings the world with us. We bring our histories with us and our legacies with us. We bring our emotions with us. We bring what happened to us this morning with us. We bring the stuff that's distracting us into the classroom, right? I had to teach two of my classes the day after the 2016 election. I went into a class at 11 o'clock in the morning after the, after the election of 2016 and had to teach the ballot and the bullet speech by Malcolm X, the fire next time by James Baldwin, and the letter from Birmingham jail from Martin Luther King. That was a difficult teaching day. Right? That was a day in which I had five undocumented students who were sobbing in my classroom as I was trying to lecture to them because they thought they were going to get deported. Right? So we don't exist in hermetically sealed classrooms. Like we bring the world into our classroom and hopefully we bring the classroom into the world. So getting rid of these compartmentalizations I think is important. A second challenge is risk aversion. Right? That too often I think universities, particularly elite universities and private universities and privileged universities and powerful universities, teach students to play it safe. Teach students not to take risks, not to speak out. The point is to become the boss, not the whistleblower. The point is to become the power, not the speak truth to power. And too often we reinforce these messages in our students. And, to, and we incorporate this into the curriculum. We ask them to ask critical questions in the classroom, but not of society, not of each other. To hold our text to account in some way, but not to hold each other to account in the same way. And so that risk aversion, I think, is, is a real problem. And we're seeing it right now. One of the things that I'm seeing at school that I'm actually struggling with right now with my, with my deans um, is that there is a tendency right now at Harvard in particular, which is a place that is generally pretty liberal in terms of student body, in terms of the faculty, the Kennedy School faculty, they did an audit of who gave what money to whom. Uh, and one of the things that they uh, discovered was that 91% of us gave money to either Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton in the Democratic Party. So we skew a certain way, right? And that's, that's true, right? But so one of the things that's happening now is we're inviting more and more conservative speakers to campus, Republican speakers, our, our, our commencement speakers can be John Kasich. Nothing wrong with any of that, right? But there's almost a kind of overcompensation in the other direction direction so that we are not viewed by the world and by Fox News and by other people as being too liberal or too progressive. God help us if we're seen as being part of the Trump resistance. And so there's a risk aversion there. Another challenge I think is the challenge of elitism. And I want to name that because one of the things that's interesting is Harvard has always been a factory for elites. Right? Harvard has always been an institution that takes people from wherever they are and turns them into people with power and privilege. Right? That's just true. I always tell my students, if you graduate from here, you'll always be great. You may not ever be good, but you'll always be great. Right? And that was fine, I guess. That was understandable in a, in a world a generation or two ago where everybody who came to Harvard was an elite. But now we have people from all across the socioeconomic spectrum. We have diversity of every kind at Harvard. And one of the things that I think that we don't do enough of is to encourage that rich diversity of class and color and creed and circumstance to become a more democratic kind of army in the world. Right? To, to, to be people who aren't just a kind of new multicultural elite that replaces the old white male straight elite. Right? To be a group of people who are graduating from these institutions that are going out into the world that aren't just trying to preserve the status quo but are actually trying to transform society into a better place. 
Let me now transition to the pedagogical commitments and give you a couple of examples of stuff that I've been doing in my own teaching and learning career and, and um, uh, pedagogically that tries to reinforce and teach the values of public service and social justice. One thing that I've come to uh, love recently is uh, my dear colleague Cornel West, who's a good friend of mine, uh, has this concept of democratic soul craft that he uses to characterize a particular kind of teaching pedagogy. And the way that he characterizes democratic soul craft, and this is something only Cornel West could sort of like express in the world. If I get up and talked about this without quoting him, I would sound probably a little bit, uh, a little bit out there. But Cornel West is on to something here. He says the democratic soul craft as a pedagogical imperative is something that seeks to connect the heart and the soul with the mind. And he talks about the three components of democratic soul crafts of being teaching and learning about critical inquiry, asking critical questions of texts, of each other, of society, of systems and structures. The second component of democratic soul craft as a pedagogical commitment is to develop within classrooms and within ourselves and within communities and within societies a kind of radical empathy. The idea that we are trying deeply to understand one another despite our differences, that we're staying at the table when we get in fights and when we get in disagreements, when we feel like we're at an impasse, that we stay and push through and develop that kind of resilient and radical empathy that opens up possibilities for solidarities, not just understandings. And then the third part of this is a, what he calls, which I love as a historian, a mature sense of history a mature sense of whatever we're studying having roots, having a context, having some place to put it so that we can draw an understanding of the past or infuse whatever we are doing in the present with an understanding of where we came from, how we got here, who we are and where we're from. And so this idea of developing critical inquiry, of radical empathy, and a mature sense of history is part of this pedagogical project that I uh, have very much, and this he gives a kind of name and nuance to something that I've felt uh, my whole life. I want to mention something that is always the elephant in the room when I have this conversation, and when I have this, when I talk about this kind of work, which is work that I love and that I've been committed to for a generation, is the concept, the idea of politics in the classroom. My, it's the elephant in the room, it's the boogie person. And people always, oh, but don't, you know, isn't it, you know, you're, you're political. These are political things. And I said, of course they are. All right? In the age of Google, if you can't figure out someone's politics in about 30 seconds, that means that they're not that engaged in the world. If you have a Twitter feed or a Facebook feed or you're on social media, you've said something in the media or someone's videotaped you doing something, you've published anything, which is usually the case for those of us in universities and in public life in some way, people are gonna know our politics. There isn't a student who walks into my classroom at the Kennedy School who doesn't know that I worked as an LGBT advisor for Barack Obama in 2008 and that I didn't work as a communicator advisor in the general election in 2016 for Hillary Clinton. That marks me. There's not a student who comes to my classroom who doesn't know that I did anti-apartheid work and living wage work and got arrested protesting the Iraq and Afghanistan war and was blacklisted by Lynn Cheney in the month after 9-11 and have done all sorts of other stuff and taken 300 students down south to rebuild black churches in seven states that were burned by arsonists and white supremacists. Every student who comes into my classroom knows all of that about me and I haven't even gotten to my five books and 80 articles and media interviews and documentary films. And I'm not bragging about that, I'm just saying that there's no student in this day and age who can come into my classroom and pretend that I'm not about something. And so, as a result of that, I'm honest about it. And what I tell them at the beginning is that if you insist that you are without politics, that's a politics of its own. So let's just own where we are and who we are and what we value. And then let's get after it and build a community and try to understand one another and try to push through those disagreements and debates and get to something bigger and better and bolder. Right, let's do that. And then I end with a kind of joke where I say, you know, look, folks, I want to make a promise to you that I'm not going to hide who I am, but I don't want you to hide who you are either. And you have a guarantee from me that I am not trying to use this classroom to turn you into another version of me because my husband would be the first one to tell you that the world has one more Tim McCarthy than it needs. <laughs> We don't need to create as teachers automatons or widgets or sort of versions of ourselves, right? What we're trying to do is get our students to become their best selves so they can do the best job they can of contributing to society. And so that's how I deal with that at the beginning. It doesn't work for everyone, but I will say in 22 years of teaching, I have never once 
gotten a teaching evaluation comment and they're all anonymous from any student who has ever felt like they were repressed or oppressed or silenced in my classroom. In fact, the conservative students go out of their way to say, I'm really, I, I was surprised how open-minded Professor McCarthy was. I expected him to be more limited in his mind. So a couple of uh, tastes of some of the classes I teach. The first thing I want to mention is this alternative spring break church rebuilding program. And this is a program that I started and was part of in 1997 when there was a wave of black church burnings in the American South that got a lot of attention actually during the 1996 re-election campaign of Bill Clinton and Al Gore. And there had been a spate of church burnings that were in Alabama and Tennessee and other parts of the South um, that were churches that were burned down by white arsonists. And so a group of folks from Columbia, campus chaplains, got together uh, to plan a trip to, Bowl to, to Greensboro, Alabama, which is the catfish capital of Alabama, it says it on the water cooler, uh, and to go down there and to rebuild the Rising Star Baptist Church, which had been burned down by a white arsonist in the South. And I did that that year in part because I was miserable in graduate school. I was in the library all the time. I was in books all the time. I was knee deep in historical archives and I felt like I was losing my connection to the world even though I was living in the middle of New York City and Harlem at one of the great universities in the world. And I felt like I was losing myself. And one of my students actually came into my office hours and said, you know, I was her TA. She said, you know, you seem really miserable, which is never a good sign <laughs> when your student comes in and tells you in office hours that you seem miserable. And she said, well, why don't you go on this alternative spring break program that I signed up for because I can't go. So we switched pre 9-11, switched her ticket to my name, $25, and on I went to Greensboro, Alabama. And we rebuilt that church or helped rebuild it. And then for 15 consecutive years, I decided that I was going to keep doing that work and keep bringing these students down south. And the first couple of years when I was at Columbia, we flew down because we had that funding. When I got to Harvard, we didn't have that funding. And so we would get in vans on Friday morning before spring break and we would drive to different places in Alabama and Georgia and South Carolina and North Carolina and West Virginia and other places throughout the country, mostly in the south. We did one church in West Virginia and one church in Springfield, Massachusetts, actually, that was burned the night that Barack Obama was elected in in 2008. And these were trips over the time where we built, we rebuilt 15 churches in eight states and there were 300 plus students that were all Harvard undergraduates at the time and they came down south and they did this work. And this was an opportunity, it was the first alternative spring break program at Harvard. Now there are many, there are dozens of them where students will spend spring break doing consolidated or targeted kinds of service learning work. And what we did there, it wasn't a part of the curriculum, it was part of Phillips Brooks House Association, but what we did is we built a kind of intellectual architecture around that course. We were able to, to build it. I developed a reading packet. We used to call them van seminars because we'd be driving down south in vans and we'd be reflecting on the readings and we'd be debating the readings and talking about all of these things. And on the way back, we'd be doing moral reflections. And this was happening, going and coming, and all over the south while we were there. Many of these students went back for more. They went back year in and year out for four consecutive years, and it deeply influenced the kind of lives that they've lived in the world. My students used to joke that I was probably the only faculty member at Harvard that could run a seminar on slavery and a seminar on sheet rocking. And these were trips that really helped to change my life, and they were trips that were originally inspired by Robert Coles's exhortation that if I were to understand this country, and particularly the racial dilemmas in this country, that I had to go south, and he was right. Those trips changed a lot of lives. Second thing I wanted to mention is a course that I've taught since 2001-2002 at Harvard called American Protest Literature from Tom Paine to Tupac. This is a course that has subsequently inspired a kind of like little cottage industry of scholarship around what protest literature means. My colleague John Stoffer and I, he's an English professor, we co-designed this course when we were still graduate students and we were newly uh, uh, hired tutors in Harvard's History and Literature program. We decided we wanted to teach a course. And I thought of this course as a kind of a little bit more radical version of what Robert Coles's Literature of Social Reflection course would be. A course in the post 9-11 world that would really really give students a kind of rich understanding of the roots of protest literature 
and of protest and dissent culture in the United States as a way to inspire them to think about how they could create their own works of protest. And so this is a course where we go from Tom Paine's Common Sense and the Declaration of Independence through David Walker's Appeal and Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin and the visual culture in the middle of the 20th century and Upton Sinclair's The Jungle and Betty Friedan's uh, 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 Feminine Mystique and James Baldwin's Fire Next Time, The Letter from Birmingham Jail, Tony Kushner's Angels in America, Audre Lorde's Essays. We go through a whole range of texts from the American Revolution through the present day to try to give students an understanding of that long tradition and history of works of protest literature. Big works of protest literature like Uncle Tom's Cabin and Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath and The Fire Next Time that inspire social movements. And then little more subtle and more obscure kinds of works of protest literature that were important nonetheless as expressions of ordinary people's dissent against the structures of power that exist in the world. And this course culminates with a final project where students actually create their own protest literature. They create documentary films, rap albums, uh, visual culture, they've, they've, they've published zines, they do social media campaigns, um, and they produce their own works of protest literature so that they enter into that space, not just as academics studying and analyzing this stuff from history, but as producers and creators and activists themselves, and then they have to analyze themselves. They actually have to write, create some kind of protest literature and then create an analytical essay where they're actually analyzing themselves. They're doing a close reading of their own work and a moral reflection and a political reflection as well. And it's an incredible class that helps the students, I think, and this is a class that's usually 100, 200 students a year, so we've taught several thousands of students over the years, that gets students to think of themselves not just as people who are analyzing the past and texts and so forth, but actual active participants in the world of social change. Another course that I'm particularly proud of is an undergraduate seminar that I just finished teaching. In fact, I read the papers on my way here this morning, so I have to turn in grades on Friday for my students. It's called Stories of Slavery and Freedom in the Modern World, and this is a course that seeks to do something that's slightly different from either of those two other enterprises. The one thing that I'm trying to do in this class is to create what one scholar has actually called, who studied this class, a brave community that to turn a classroom that is reckoning with the most difficult, some of the most difficult issues in American society, issues of slavery and freedom, the paradox that gave birth to the nation, the moral, central moral contradiction of the first half of this nation's history, the incredible and complex and terrifying inheritances that flow from the fact that this was a nation that said that it was about freedom and equality and the rights of citizenship and opportunity and the pursuits of happiness, but was in fact rooted in a racialized system of economic exploitation and ideology of white supremacy that continues to the present day. And this is a course that often draws a very diverse range of students, this was, I had a cl the class this term had 12 students, eight of them were students of color, six African American, and then four students, as one of my African American students said, we have the four wokest white kids in Harvard College in this seminar, and thank God, because it would have been awkward otherwise. And it's a course where these students come together and they wrestle with these issues. They wrestle with them from very different subject positions, very different reservoirs of knowledge and understanding. Some of them have never read any of these texts. Some of them have read many of these texts. And they come together and they do what this scholar Janine DeNoves, my colleague at the Ed School, has written. They create together. They co-constitute what we call a brave community. And a brave community is one where people can, what she says, stay at the table to develop a kind of moral courage to stay in the presence of a difficult and contested terrain and develop and push through those disagreements and those differences to achieve a resilient empathy, a version of that radical empathy that Cornel West has talked about. And one of the things that's interesting about this class is that term over term after term, the students do get to a place where it's clear they want to get up from the table. They want to walk away. They can't confront each other anymore. They're disagreeing too vehemently, and yet they stay there. Sometimes they stay after class for 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour, in one case, two hours. We had a double seminar one time where they just wanted to stay and work this out because they didn't want to go home angry at each other. And they push through that, and it's uncomfortable, and it's difficult, and it's hard for me, and sometimes I don't know what I'm doing. 
But they model this kind of thing. And I think about the, the histories of slavery and freedom and the reckoning with race and racism that we desperately need as a country, that we are afraid to have, that this classroom provides a little bit of a space for. And it's because those students are willing to do that work. I wish I could say it's because of my brilliant pedagogical theorization and practice. It's not. I just sit there and bear witness and try to hold them while they do this. And they do it year in and year out. And speaking of holding space and doing it year in and year out, there's a course at the Kennedy School that I teach called the Arts of Communication. And this is a course that's billed as a leadership and communications course. It's, it's a class that's, is, that is dedicated to a pedagogy of, practice, of learning by doing, of practicing. These are students we place in different leadership scenarios where they have to give different kinds of speeches or they have to speak in public in some way. So we throw them into media interviews and debates, contentious terrains. They have to give value speeches and storytelling speeches and policy problem solution speeches and political framing speeches and they have to at the end of the term give a toast or tribute to someone in the room who has impacted them positively over the course of the term. And this too is a community that develops because they have to do some things in this class that they aren't normally used to doing and that our political culture does not encourage and that is to listen deeply and speak lovingly and to be willing in front of an audience of people to find your strength and your voice through a practice of vulnerability. That we push them into these spaces that they would not choose to be in, that they don't like, that they find very, very uncomfortable, even the moment where they have to get up and say something nice about somebody. They have a hard time doing that because we don't live in a world where we do that a lot. We don't live in a, when's the last time someone said to you, you say something nice to your neighbor? What do you most admire about the person next to you? What's the thing you most respect about the person you disagree with the most? Right, when is that, when do we ever ask each other that? And we ask each other that in this class, but one of the other things that happens is this is a class where the world enters the class every day. The world enters the class every day, and one of the things that happened this year that was profound and transformative, was the fact that the Me Too movement hit, became very public and very controversial in the middle of the first semester of this year. And students were still kind of reeling with what they were gonna do with their lives in the wake of this kind of political moment we're living in. And then all of these stories of sexual assault and abuse and of terrible behavior mostly by men and the silences that women are often forced to endure that people started to come out and started to speak out and started to call out. And what happened in that class is that eight of my 40 students, all women as it turns out in this instance, used this class to tell their own Me Too stories, to give Me Too speeches about their own experience with sexual assault, two of them while at the Kennedy School, and to share those stories in every instance for the first time in their lives with an audience of people that they had come to trust or that they trusted enough to feel like they would hold them. And that happened. And everyone listened. And the men in particular listened. And this was the first time many of those men, as I know from the one-on-one -on -one conversations I had in office hours, had ever had to reckon with the reality that is so often the reality of women in particular, but of other people who have been subjected to this unconscionable assault and predatory behavior. And I could see something changing in that class. And then there were men who wanted to figure out how they could support more and they went home and had conversations with their wives and their girlfriends and their sisters and their mothers and their daughters. And they too began to tell their own stories and to give their own speeches. And it turned into this healing space where people left that room and that class feeling like they were strong or stronger and freer for the first time. And it was one of the things in my teaching career that I will say I will remember forever. It moved me to the core. It shook me into a different kind of teacher. And the last thing I wanna just mention before I give these quick lessons at the end is that I have been teaching for the last uh, 17 years in a program called the Clemente Course in the Humanities, which is a 
college humanities course for low-income adults in Dorchester, which is a part of Boston. It's the largest part of Boston and also the most diverse. It's 6.2 miles from my office in Harvard Square uh, and couldn't be a more different place to teach. I teach in the basement of a community health center. All of my students are people who live, adults who live below the poverty line. Many of them are single parents. Some are immigrants. Some are wrestling with housing insecurity. Some come to class and go home from class to shelters. These are folks who sometimes are hungry, so we have food for them, sometimes can't afford childcare, so they bring their kids to class. And it's in a community health center that provides them with health care and with support and with a whole bunch of wraparound services so that they can go to school. And this was a course that was founded by a journalist named Earl Shores in the 90s. Uh, and the, the, simp the simple logic of the course and promise of the course is that a humanities education is essential for us to become more humane citizens and that every single person in the world deserves a humanities education, free of charge, accessible to all that to rarefy or to privilege the study of the humanities is precisely one of the things that maintains the inhumanity of our world. And so for 17 years now, I've been getting in my car around the T uh, after long days of teaching in uh, Cambridge and at Harvard, and I drive to Cobham Square Health Center and I teach in the evenings on Monday. I taught last night, actually. Uh, I taught um, the, the Cold War and the Lavender Scare and the emergence of feminism and the Students for Democratic Society, and we had an amazing conversation about nuclear proliferation and student movements and all sorts of things. And we'll go back next Monday for our last class to teach the civil rights movement, Montgomery bus boycott, letter from Birmingham jail, etc. And this is a course that has, is for me, a way to live out a kind of value that I have always had pedagogically and also politically. And that's to redistribute resources. Right, that one of the great ironies of my life is that I spend so much of my time outside of the institution where I live and teach and where I get my bread um, that is the most powerful and the most privileged institution of higher education in the world and has been for quite some time. It has more money in its endowment, second only to the Vatican in terms of the richest nonprofit in the world, and we just added $10.1 billion to that. So there are a lot of resources to redistribute. And so I try as best I can in my own little way to redistribute myself along with those resources outward and to make sure that I'm trying to connect the dots both in terms of what I model and to how we teach and ask questions and learn so that my students can see that this compartmentalization of the real world and the university of the classroom and extracurricular activities of service and justice are not things that we should be compartmentalizing but boundary lines that we should be blurring if not exploding. And so my work in the Clemente course and my advocacy for programs like this across the nation, our course shared the National Humanities Medal. The last year President Obama was in the presidency because it was a course that he at least saw as being a model for how to redistribute resources in terms of high access to higher education, opportunities for higher education that all of my students want and that none of them have ever had the opportunity to afford. And so we try to bring it to them. Let me close quickly with uh, just a couple of lessons. The first lesson that I've learned through all this work is to get out and go back. That there is an enormous amount of value to getting outside of that hermetically sealed space of the university, of the classroom, of institutions of privilege, and getting out into the real world to be the bridge between and across that boundary line as best we can. And to go back over and over and over again, because one of the things that I've learned in my life, and which is, I think, a central challenge for service learning or experiential learning or these kinds of uh, curricular engagements is that so often they're fleeting, they're for a time, right? It's for a week or a semester or a period that then, gets, then goes away. And that one of the things that I have found in my own work in terms of developing deep solidarities and coalitions and, 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 and uh, connections uh, that endure and sustain and that have power is that they don't endure and sustain unless you keep going back over and over and over again. And so going back to those places in the South for 15 years, going back to Dorchester every year, going back into my classrooms at Harvard, this is something that I think is important. Another lesson I've learned is the value and importance of knowing your roots and your history. I'm a historian and so it's probably easy for me to say that I think history matters and I think history matters as much or if not more than anything else. The other historians in the room are nodding their head and obviously that is important. But I do believe, you know, it's a cliche to say if we don't know where we're, if we don't know the past, we're destined to repeat it. I mean, 
all you got to do is read the paper every day and know that that is not only a cliche, but deeply, deeply true. And so we have to know our history. So everything I do in my classes and pedagogically is rooted in that history. Another thing that I think is really important, another lesson I've learned, is the, val is the value of keeping values and reflection, moral values and moral reflection at the center of the work. One of the things we do in all of these pedagogical commitments is to try to collectively, and this means me putting myself on the line too, constantly centering values, moral values, ethical values, and moral reflection, the constant reflection, both at the level of the self and in the classroom, at the level of the community, about what we're doing, what we're about, why we're drawn to this, why we do what we do, are we doing it ethically, are we doing it effectively, the constant feedback loop of moral reflection so that we can figure out and, and really center what those moral values are that drive our work. Another lesson that I've learned over the years is the importance of staying at the table. Not just going back to the communities that we work in, that we're part of, so that we become them, but also to stay at the table when it's most difficult. One of the things that I am struggling with and my students are wrestling with and that we at the university are wrestling with and that we as a society are wrestling with is we are not very good at having difficult conversations. We are not very good at existing in discomfort zones and navigating contentious terrain and communications. One of the things that I did a couple of weeks ago was to have a reflection with all of the leaders and students who went on the Palestine trek and the Israel trek. We have two treks over spring break. We have an Israel trek where 150 students go to Israel, and we have a Palestine track where 150 students go to Palestine. Israel and Palestine is about the size of New Jersey. They don't talk to each other, they don't meet, they don't travel together, and they don't have post-reflections. So they wanted this year to have one, in part because of what's going on over there, and we see this flaring up again yesterday, and it's a crisis. And we have Israeli and Palestinian students and students who care very deeply about Middle East peace and about national identity and so forth. And this year, for the first time, we had one of those sessions and they asked me to facilitate it, which I was very grateful and honored to do. But that's com that conversation is not easy. We know that. We just have to read the paper to know that. But it's also a conversation that's not easy because too few people run away from it. They don't come to the table at all because they're afraid that the conversation is going to be difficult. And when it gets difficult, they don't stay at the table. And we have to stay at the table if we are going to move through difference to understanding, to solidarity, to that radical kind of empathy that should be reciprocal, we have to stay at the table. We can't head for the hills. And then the last one that I will say, lesson I've learned, is the value of listening to other people's stories and perspectives. And this is something I see over and over again. One of the through lines of this course, uh, one of the through lines of all my courses and all this work is the, the ways in which these opportunities allow us to listen to other people's stories and then be able to tell our own in relationship to them. Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a Buddhist monk who I start my Arts of Communication with, class with, talks about the value of deep listening and loving speech. And we start my class by talking about deep listening and loving speech and that it's the deep listening that has to precede the loving speech, that we can't love and speak lovingly until we have listened deeply to another person's life and experience. And I do think that that's really where it's about. And for me, that brings me to a place that gets me back to Robert Coles. Robert Coles always had lots of ways of being self-deprecating and he often would talk about himself. He said, I hate being an expert. And I said, what do you mean by that? You've, you know, you've done all this work and training and you have this education, you're a Harvard professor. And he goes, I hate being an expert. I hate people wanting to come to me to get knowledge. He's like, I'd rather experience life with them and build knowledge together. And if there's anything for me, pedagogically, that I gain from all of this, among all those things, it's just that experience is more important than expertise. That getting in the world with people, whether that's in a classroom or in a van on the way to rebuild a church or in a community health center in Dorchester or anywhere in between, that it's that experience and those experiences together that help open us up to a different kind of a world and call us 
to repair the world and to heal the world and to make the world a better place, which after all, if we're in the work of service and justice, is the point of it all. Thank you. Okay, great job, thank you. We got time for some questions, so please uh, raise your hands. We'll get the microphone to you. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, Mr. McCarthy. Uh, you mentioned earlier in your speech that you had some kind of association or work with the uh, Black Lives Matter program. Mm -hmm. That was one of the major initial uh, initiatives that went out when President Obama went out. Could you update us on that? <laughs> Uh, yeah. So when I said uh, black, when I mentioned Black Lives Matter earlier, I mentioned that as part of a, a, a set of commitments that our students, student activists, are very much engaged with on campus. And uh, and I see this, you know, like I see all current social movements and, and activist kinds of commitments as being part of a longer history, right? The Black Lives Matter movement is just the most recent kind of manifestation of a long history black black struggle. And it's interesting, and I don't think um, a lot of people are perplexed by this. I don't. I don't see it, we were talking about this before, Nikolai and I, uh, I don't see it as particularly like hard to understand that the first black presidency, right, and the first black president would have the kind of effect that it has had to garner a whole new way of, for some people to come together in a multicultural kind of solidarity and coalition to get him elected and then re-elected, and so the, half the country was sort of committed to that, roughly. And then other half of the country lost its mind Right and uh, and could never wrap their head around it. Never thought he was legitimate. There was one of my one of my least favorite but but striking data points is that there was a bullet shortage in the United States in December of 2008. There was a bullet shortage because so many people were buying guns and bullets to guard against the Obama presidency, which was going to come and take your guns, even though he never in eight years plus of the campaign never said he was ever going to do that and didn't ever do that. So the idea that a Black Lives Matter movement, right, which would be responding to the crisis of mass incarceration, would be in responding to the differential treatment of black and brown people versus white people with respect to drugs and all sorts of other kinds of things, would be responding to the ubiquitous visual reminder of police brutality against black people and black bodies. Um, all of that, that they would, that this generation that really only knows President Obama as president, I mean, my niece, if Hillary Clinton had won, she would have gone to the prom without ever knowing a white man could be president of the United States, right? And so, th so the idea that a first black president and presidency, particularly a two-term one and a successful one, um, would unleash what was already there in America in terms of the torrents of racism and white supremacy and, and this kind of vicious white vigilante violence, which we're seeing all over the place and that's been ginned up by Trump and, and his folks, um, it's no surprise that this movement would emerge within that same context, right? That there's what I call a paradox of progress, that we make progress in certain ways and then there's a fierce reaction against that progress. And we've seen this in African American history from the dawn of the Republic or even beforehand all the way down till now. So when I talk about the Black Lives Matter movement, I see my students deeply engaged and deeply involved in this, the young folks in particular. And I do think there's a generational dimension to this. I do think it's their movement. Um, I had a moment a really weird moment, um, but one that I was um, happy to, to rise to. Um, after uh, Ferguson, after uh, Michael Brown's murder and, and what happened in Ferguson that summer of 2014, the students had a die-in and a rally uh, on campus and the black student organizations had come together in to plan the rally and the die-in and they uh, and it was the last day of classes, the last day of my stories of slavery and freedom class as it turns out and they got together and they voted, all of them, all the leaders of the black student groups for one white person to speak at the rally about what it meant to be in solidarity on racial justice issues as a white ally. And they had voted me to be the person to do that, to give that speech at the rally, which was deeply uncomfortable. I didn't want to do it, right? Because I didn't think it was my place. I'm not a leader in this movement. I'm just a person who is in solidarity with racial justice. And so I did, and I sat down and didn't say anything else. Um, but I think it's a powerful movement. I think it's one that um, poses lots of challenges for people who understand social movements um, in older kinds of frameworks, right? They're not a movement that has um, aligned itself with the Democratic Party. They're not a movement 
until very recently that's come up with like a 10 point plan for things and um, they're less interested in policy implementation than they are in activism and organizing and, and, and real radical kinds of protest. And so I think they're, uh, they're, in a, they're in an important space right now in American society, particularly as we've seen the forces of white supremacy experience a kind of vocal and visible and vigilant resurgence in the wake of Trump's election. So I think the Black Lives Matter movement is being targeted in fiercer ways than it ever has been before in its short life, but I also think it's never been more important than it is now, and I, I hope that they keep at it because they're raising important questions that our policymakers are frankly not answering and not asking. Question. Suzanne, yeah. Hi, thanks for coming. Hi. Thanks. So I'm really interested in your concept of staying at the table and developing this deep empathy, but what I'm seeing a lot in, in my work, in my world, and, and trying to stay at that table is that it seems to me that your argument is that you're assuming there are good faith actors well, yeah. and that it's not just a practice of domination of the other person. And that's where I find an impasse, mm -hmm. even when you provide new data for them to perhaps change their mind. Yeah. Uh, so I just want you to comment on that because that's what's happening. Yeah, no, no. Can I ask you, you mentioned your work and your world. What is your work and your world? Uh, I do public policy work uh, for the teachers union. Okay, oh, right, great. Thank you for that work. Uh, so uh, a couple things there. First of all, um, I think you're right that there is a difference between staying at the table with people who could potentially be good faith collaborators or interlocutors or you know, interrogators uh, and people who are, are not interested in pushing beyond that. When I talk about staying at the table, I'm talking about staying at the table with folks who are willing at least in, a, in an, an ideal sense, to, to work through some things because they do want to get to something better. That they're not, um, they're not, uh, they haven't fetishized the status quo. They're not trying to lord their power over others. And I think there's a, there's a different dynamic when you're negotiating, say, a union contract than when you're at a seminar table reckoning with the legacies of slavery. Right? Not that they're unrelated, but I think that those are, those are one's a more specific context, right? For where there's like a, a, a matter of sort of striker employment on the, on the line, right? That kind of a thing. Um, but I think that it's important for us to discern and to ask tough questions of our interlocutors to determine whether or not they are good faith actors, right? That I think there's, a, there's an important, it's important for us to ask enough questions to interrogate and be direct about this and clear to determine whether or not someone is operating from a place of, of unintended ignorance, right? A lack of information, no exposure or encounter, no way of understanding another person's lived experience or another group's lived experience. That's one kind of ignorance. That's an ignorance I can work with, right? Or the willful ignorance where you know that this person, for instance, wants to use male pronouns and you willfully misgender them all the time after they've told you over and over again that that's the case. Or that you, every time someone, a black person says, look, this is my experience with police officers, this is my experience with the criminal justice system and then the first move that you make is to say yeah but all lives matter right if that if, if that's what you're doing then then you're not actually at the same table even though you physically might be and so I think it's really important for us to like ask those questions to get to a place where we can make those distinctions and then push through whatever disagreements and incompatibilities and so forth that we have. I tell my students all the time, I take a rights-based approach to communications, right? You have the right to speak, you have the right to be heard, you have the right to take up space in the room, and you have the right to walk away. And you have the right to walk away if that context becomes violent, if it becomes like an impasse that you cannot possibly sort of penetrate or move through. But what I'm talking about in the context of this kinds of you know, brave communities in the classrooms is when everybody has ostensibly signed on to a particular kind of enterprise, right? Everyone's enrolled in the class. Everyone has sort of heard the norms and the expectations, has helped to co-constitute the norms of the classroom conversation and yet still find it hard to align with them or, or, or live up to them which is often the case. But what I'm talking about is in those kinds of situations where the first sign of discomfort is when we run for the hills, the flight impulse takes over, right? And the fight impulse, it's either fight or flight rather than something else. And I think we need to come up with a different 
way of thinking about this. Rather than always fight or always flee, what's a third space, right? I'm interested in finding that third space. In classrooms, in conversations, in moments of contentious political debate or conflict. Um, but again, you have to, I think, do the work to discern like who's really in it to push past, the, who, who will at least agree that where we are now is not acceptable? And then let's move to another place. But if someone is like, no, this is unacceptable and I love this space, right? That may not be somebody that you're ever gonna have that conversation with and so be it. But I want us to develop the capacity to be more resilient in the discomfort zones, in the contentious terrain, so that we can, some of us, push through, develop that kind of radical empathy and then work together to make a new kind of world. That's what, that's what I'm talking about. But there are gonna be people who are never gonna be part of that project and you, know, you can't waste too much time on that. But you gotta discern who they are as quickly as you can and then either move through or move on. I know we got a lot more questions, yeah. but uh, we're also running out of time. Oh, right. That's okay, it's good because we're gonna let you stay around and visit with anybody. You know what we could do is uh, ha ask like three or four people to ask questions and I'll kind of respond once to, to a group of them. Well, that's fine, that but all right. all right, so how do you wanna do it? Because I've got some people that are gonna have to leave. Oh, okay, that's fine, that's fine, whatever. You, so you, you run the show. Why don't we do this? Why don't we have people who would like to come up and visit with him Please come up and visit with him because I know some of you already told me that you had to go ahead and leave. So let's give uh, Dr. Uh, Tim McCarthy a great hand. And, and please come visit with him. Thanks.